Discovering the Spiritual and Scientific Universe, the Universal Learning Series. I'm your host, Sandy Andrew. Welcome. On this edition of the show, we will be discussing the topic of multiple universes with Dr. Stephen Manley. The idea of a multiple universe reality is no longer considered speculative or implausible by many physicists. Rather, it is deemed inescapable. Distinct concepts of the multiverse spring from quantum mechanics, cosmology, string theory-based cosmology, and ideas about a mathematics-based reality that borders on the religious. The new book, Visions of the Universe, by Dr. Stephen Manley, explores many questions. Just what is a multiverse? What are the different concepts of the multiverse and how are they related? Is it possible to determine if we live in a multiverse or even in multiple types of multiverses? How do religious concepts of the afterlife and popular ideas based on the law of attraction relate to the scientific visions of the multiverse? Professor Manley teaches at the University of Rochester. He was named the New York State Professor of the Year and more recently was a recipient of the 2001 Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching Award by the American Association of Physics Teachers. Please visit his website at pass.rochester.edu. That's P-A-S dot Rochester dot E-D-U. And let's welcome Dr. Stephen Manley to the Universal Learning Series radio show. Hi, Sandy. Thank you for joining us here today, um, Steve. Let's um, start off with this question. Okay. What is a multiverse? <laughs> well, that's a good place to start because when I first sat down to learn about this stuff, I, I had an I, I was I was actually wanting to write a, a different book about the convergence of the very small and the very large, and um, it, it, we were we were having trouble selling this particular book because editors and book companies sort of thought it had been wrongfully. I think the book that I wanted to write had been published already. So my mm-hmm. agent kept saying, "Hey, you should write a book about the multiverse," and I kept saying, "Well." what do I know about the multiverse? And every time we had a conversation, he'd say, you should write a book about the multiverse. Finally, I said, fine, I will look into it. And so I started actually doing research. And I had I had heard a little bit about the multiverse, of course, and, and some quantum mechanics and a little bit in cosmology, but I really hadn't studied those things. I'm a particle physicist. and um, I mean, I'd studied some quantum mechanics and cosmology, but not in the multiverse sort of way. So mm-hmm. I sat down and I looked at it, and all of a sudden I realized there were there were many different concepts coming at me from all different angles. And finally, I had to sit down and think, well, what I want to do, I mean, because I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a physics geek, right, or I'm a science mm-hmm. geek. So what do we, what we do, we <laughs> classify, and I mean, that's the first stage actually of of trying to learn about things is to actually classify them and sort mm-hmm. of distinguish and, and categorize. And so so I was trying to do that. And then I realized, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure I know what a universe is, much less a multiverse. So so that's really um, – so if we want to talk about the multiverse, we really have mm-hmm. to talk for a moment about the universe. Mm-hmm. So what do we mean when we say universe? And and I pondered this a bit. And, and, and so I, I have a little bit of a sciencey definition in that – I think of the universe as anything that we could ever possibly be causally connected to in in sort of a scientific observational sort of way. So it's something we can smell, feel, touch, build an instrument that can actually detect something that's coming from it, etc. And then if we if we call that our universe because because universe is a very all-inclusive term. So we're 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 including, you know, everything from uh, obnoxious teenagers to dogs to distant <laughs> stars and galaxies and and everything and, and and we're also including actually parts of reality which are bigger than our current observable universe because 
because our observable universe is actually growing every day. You know, basically, if you had the ultimate telescope that could really see all the way to the edge of what what we are causally connected to, the size of our the sphere that we would be observing is growing with a radius that grows at one light year per year because light goes one light year in a year. So it's getting bigger. So if we say let us wait forever – then you might think, well, that will encompass whatever is out there. But that's not true because we live in this expanding universe. So as as you as 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 we look at things that are further and further away, they're actually moving away from us faster and faster. And there comes a point where the space is expanding such that it actually is moving faster than the speed of light. So it turns out that we, we actually have a finite region of reality that we are causally connected to. So 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 that's how I define a universe. And then I say, well Anything that lies outside of that then is a multiverse. And then I could actually sit down and try to categorize and classify. Hmm. Um, different concepts of the universe. How, I mean, this the topic of parallel universes and multiverses has really come on strong in the last five to ten years, at least on mainstream science television. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think the main concept that that we see uh, most of the time on television is actually one of the older multiverse concepts. It's one that comes out of quantum mechanics, mm-hmm. which, uh, which I call the many worlds multiverse. Um, that's the one that sort of tends to lead to parallel realities sharing the same space time uh what's a bit more recent uh actually are a number of concepts that are cosmological in nature so one of them i alluded to a minute ago the fact that that uh there are reasons to believe that the reality out there is actually much larger than the region that we can be causally connected to or much larger than our observable universe so there's there's stuff out there that we will never experience and that's one of the one of the classes of a of a multiverse, and, and much of that I think is is relatively new. Which branch of science would you say, if any, explores the um, the concept of multiverses in in more detail than others? I, I guess um, the areas of science that are generating most of the multiverse concepts I'm aware of are, uh, I, I would say, cosmology. Is is generating the most of the ideas, but but the thing is, and and this is actually one of the themes of my book, and and actually was the book I was wanting to write when my agent was hassling me to write about multiverses. As it turned out, of course, I I used the multiverse as the vehicle to tell the story I wanted to tell anyway, because it actually fits right in. It's really hard in some ways to distinguish between cosmology and quantum mechanics and things like that they're all tied together when i when i was in graduate school i decided i wanted to be a particle physicist and that involves more quantum mechanics and and smashing atoms at high energies to look at very very tiny structures and the fundamental nature of the matter and i thought i wanted to do that because i wanted to have control over the experiments. I wanted to be able to turn the beam on and off and adjust the energy and, and move my detector around. And, and so science is all about making controlled experiments where you can. And I thought, well, I, I, I don't think I'm interested in doing cosmology, which is basically the study of the origin and evolution of our universe, or astronomy, because I, I can't go and turn stars on and off and get a bigger star and see how that goes. But but to tell you the truth, that was a, that was a terribly naive naive thing, Mm -hmm. partly because it's true we only live in one universe, so we suffer from being able to do statistical analyses on that, but there are lots of stars and lots of galaxies out there, so rather than go and find a different, and and tune the galaxy or galaxies or stars that you're looking at, you have billions of them to, to look at, so in a sense, you do your controlled experiment by looking at all different classes of stars and, and studying them that way. So it was a bit naive on my part. The other thing that was very naive about my about, on my part is 
we live in this expanding universe, and if we go back in time, the universe was much hotter and denser. And lo and behold, if you want to understand the evolution of the universe, you really have to understand the nature of matter when it is much more energetic or hot and dense. That's particle physics. That's mm-hmm. the study of the very small, the nature of the forces, the particles that were there. And so it turns out that there's really an intimate relationship between quantum mechanical things and cosmological things. In fact, um, there's an idea in cosmology called inflation, which postulates that the universe started out really, really tiny and went through a period of absolutely phenomenal expansion over an absolutely bit of time that was so too, much too small to actually imagine. And the universe got, got really quite large during this period. And what happened was that... Uh, quantum fluctuations in the energy, so small fluctuations in the level of energy in the space-time at that point, basically got blown up the cosmological scales. And this structure um, is what has what led to the, the energy asymmetries that led to the matter asymmetries that led to the regions which collapsed into galactic clusters and stars and things. Because if you didn't have some sort of asymmetry, some sort of structure to begin with, you everything would have been uh, there would there what would have started the gravitational collapse into stars and dogs and galaxies and things it all would have been a very smooth distribution so one of the biggest problems with the early big bang theory was trying to figure out what in the world actually led to the structure that we see the fact that things actually did collapse uh and so it turns out that 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 structure really comes from an imprinting from early quantum mechanical fluctuations. Brian Greene, a um, famous author and, and a string theorist at Columbia, has, has this phenomenal saying, and I know I'm going to blow it, so I, I probably shouldn't <laughs> say this is a quote, but he says something to the effect of uh, all the beautiful galaxies that are out there are, are nothing more than quantum mechanics writ large on the sky. I think he says it better than that, but I still think it's a cool saying. <laughs> so it all it all sort of messes together. So it's really hard to distinguish it. Quantum mechanics has, to, to come back to your question, quantum mechanics has one core multiverse that it, it comes up with. In cosmology, there are a number of different ones. String theory's got a couple of interesting ones. Um, you know, so so those are the main areas that are generating the multiverse ideas. Steve, what do you make of the notion of that a that we can be alive in this universe and then we can also be alive in another universe leading the same type of life, but with different <laughs> decision making? Well, you know, there's some of the interesting ideas that come out of the multiverse. I mean, when you start looking into this, it's funny. You'll uh, you'll you'll have a lot of scientifically supported reasonable ideas that you're going, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. And then you look at the implications and you go, wait a minute, that's pretty wacky. And and this is one of those crazy ideas. So uh, <laughs> let, let me let me try, I mean, there, there are a number of instances where you can have this kind of game in the multiverse, but let, let me just give you one. Um, if if we believe that this weird phenomenon called inflation, and, and there there is some scientific evidence that supports this, so this this idea of an inflation isn't completely uh, wacky. It, 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 there's some compelling reasons to to think it might happen. And in fact, uh, if we held a vote today of all the cosmologists, the the, the theoretical model they would most uh, be behind is one that it, what involves this idea of inflation, where you have this superluminal, really fast expansion at the start of things. If uh-huh. you believe in that, then the reality that is out there is vastly, vastly larger than our observable universe. And so, if you could imagine um, a huge, um, a huge water tank. You know, uh, uh, a big water tower full of marbles. And you could imagine each marble represents a region of the great reality which is equivalent in size to our observable universe. So, so then you might say, okay, well, within this water tower, how many marbles are there? How many 
observable universe size regions in this great reality are there. And people estimate, in fact, there are that that there's an infinite number that that it's that it's really that much bigger. And these are pretty loose estimates and everything. But there are legitimate scientists who actually will tell you that in terms of the regions that are out there, equivalent roughly in size to what we experience, it, it, it's 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 infinite and it's and it's outside of our experience. So this is one form of a multiverse. And and I would argue that it. This particular multiverse is, isn't actually all that controversial among, amongst most physicists that I would know. But, of course, we don't, we don't hold polls and votes, but, <laughs> but I'd love to do it. I should, I should actually hold it to a vote the next time we have a faculty meeting and see what people say. Um, I mean, the thing is, they'll actually say, oh, no, no, I don't believe in the multiverse. But then you say, okay – do you believe in the expanding universe? Do you believe in this idea of inflation? And you know, many of them will go, "Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah." And then, and then you say, "Well, the multiverse actually follows directly from this stuff." So, at any rate, the idea is that we have all of these regions, and as I mentioned a little while ago, the the, the structure of how the matter forms in these galaxies. The initial conditions of how things collapsed into the particular galaxies and stars and everything that we have are is set in motion by the quantum fluctuations in the energy as this expansion is happening. And you can imagine that that happens randomly. And the initial conditions of each of these areas in the great reality will vary in a random sort of way. But if you have an infinite number of possibilities, so the story goes, that you will have regions of this great reality where those initial conditions, those initial fluctuations and everything were absolutely identical. And if that is true, that's what leads to the idea that you can have some region in the great reality out there where everything is just like what we're experiencing here. There's an identical you talking to an identical me on an identical phone system some vast, vast distance away. Is so the story goes. There's a there's a universe out there's a region out there where Elvis lives and things like this. Because all <laughs> possibilities happen. So so it may sound sort of wacky, but but it actually follows from scientific paradigm that that has support behind it. That's not to say we can go out and find evidence. We can't step outside of our great reality and, and, and look at these different regions and show that this is true. That's one problem with multiverses because we've defined universe as all that we can actually experience. So if you say you want to look at something directly that's outside of that, you, you sort of can't. So it's a bit of a catch, you know, it's a bit of a problem with the whole idea. And some people will claim this whole idea of multiverse is more philosophy or metaphysics. But, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that's true to some extent, but you can still, you can still talk about these things in a in very reasonable way. I mean, some of them are derived from scientific ideas that have very strong scientific support. And you may not be able to go out and find those different universes and mm -hmm. prove they're there, but you can certainly infer the supporting structure that lies underneath those concepts and actually show that that's true. So people are making measurements to that can give us an indication whether or not this idea of inflation in the early universe actually happened. And if it did, then the whole thought of the multiverse follows pretty in a fairly solid way. I mean, in fact, it's hard to I, I nobody knows how to avoid the idea of the multiverse of inflation actually happened. When I was um young, very young, 10 years old perhaps, I used to tell people in my young naive way that if the universe is infinite, meaning that it never ends, then all things are possible. And I used to say, like, see this scene on the movies, on the television screen. This is being played out somewhere in the universe. And say, that's impossible. I says, in theory, and this is a 10-year-old person speaking. I said, in theory, how can it not be possible if the universe never ends? And all things possible somewhere along the line, surely, you come into them. Well, 
you were prescient because this is this is the concept uh, that's coming out in a number of different places in these in these multiverse theories. It, it it's actually uh, yeah unavoidable. Okay. Um, do you write about black holes in your book, Visions of the Multiverse? Well, I do a little bit because oddly enough, there is one form of a theory. Of, of a multiverse theory that comes out of black holes. And the uh, the guy, as far as I know, the, the, the founder of this particular idea, his name is Lee Smolin. And he's a, a theorist who studies, among other things, the idea of quantum gravity. So he, he looks at gravitation. He tries to understand gravitation when when it gets really powerful. So... So, for example, if where you have matter collapsing into a black hole, in fact, what happens is that the gravitational field is getting stronger and stronger, and it gets so strong that, in fact, even light cannot escape. Mm -hmm. And so he looks at the question of what happens inside the black hole. And um, pe people can theoretically study this idea, even though, you know, once once the black hole is formed, we are causally disconnected from it because even light cannot get out. So so whatever happens inside, we, we'll never know about. Um, but what what he says is that you could imagine that the matter in this in the in the star that collapsed in this black hole. I mean, from the equations of general relativity, my understanding is that everything will just keep collapsing in principle, all the way to what's called a singularity. So basically, you'll take the mass of the star and you put it in an actual point. And so the problem with this is that the gravitational field becomes so strong and the energy density so great that basically physics as we know it, including uh, classical general relativity, which is what we use to describe the gravitational processes, basically will break down. And in order to move beyond that, we, we need to study what happens uh, well, we need a theory of so-called quantum gravity, and and um, and so we don't have such a theory. So Smolin speculates. He 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 does something called quantum loop gravity, and I can't even tell you what that is exactly. But he does speculate on what could happen in the midst of this of this star as things collapse. And he says, suppose that as this matter of the star collapses down close to a point that it basically bounces and the space-time rather than collapsing begins to expand again you can get a solution where that expansion is just like the space-time of our expanding universe so he argues that inside a black hole you can have the space-time do a bounce and create conditions that within the expanding space-time of that black hole within it it would look like an expanding universe like we see, and it's causally disconnected from us. So it may sound very strange because it's a little bit like this ship in the bottle sort of bit, but yeah. but, it, but it actually is a solution that, that works. The, the, the dicey part in the solution is what actually happens at the bounce. It's not the fact that you get this universe born within this black hole, although conceptually – I confess that that's the sticking point for for most of us, including myself, and I have a lot of fun when I try to explain this one to my students. At any rate, so what's really fun in this idea, he claims um, in, in modern string theory and everything, we, we actually live in uh, – the theories are based in more spatial dimensions than we see. We only see three plus time. And it turns out that there are ways to mathematically – compactify those other extra dimensions so that we can't observe them. And in fact, there's some 10 to the 500 different ways of 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 doing this mathematical compactification so that so the these dimensions basically go away and we can't observe them. So his idea and it turns out that the way in which these dimensions are compactified actually leads to uh, the physical constants in, in our space-time, in our universe, things like the, the charge of the electron or the mass of the proton and uh, the strength of the various forces. So these things sort of come from the way the space is compactified. So his thought is that when when space collapses and does its bounce, that 
that there may be small quantum fluctuations in the structure, but it basically is very similar to, to the universe that gave birth to it, which means the physical constants of the universe that is born within the black hole is very similar to the to the physical constants of the universe that gave birth to it. So he gets this interesting thought that 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 you get a multiverse, basically you get a universe that can form black holes, and, and not all of them could because you have to be able to form stars that have to live long enough to burn the with through fusion the fuel that's in the core of them before they can collapse into black holes. So you can imagine universes where the physical constants are such that, that stars cannot form or that they form but they they uh, they burn out so fast that uh, I mean, there are ways in which the black holes won't form. At any rate, suppose you have a universe where black holes do form. Then he claims that within those black hole universes where black holes will form are most likely to, to be born. And within those, you'll have universes where black holes are most likely to form. And so before long, if you were able to go and make a catalog of all the universes within the multiverse, you would find that most of them have actually sort of evolved or been tweaked toward being optimal for black hole production. So then he makes a very solid claim that's a scientific claim, and this is one of the reasons he loves this theory, because he says all these multiverse theories, you basically let anything happen, and you can't make any observable claim, so it's not science, because it's not falsifiable. So Smolin says, what he claims is that because in his theory the vast majority of all the universes need, will, will evolve to be optimal for black hole production. He claims that if we look at the characteristics of our universe, the physical characteristics are such that we should be optimal for black hole production. And that is something that in principle is falsifiable. We can look at how things are in our universe, and uh, if we know enough about black holes and about the physical constants in our universe, perhaps we can actually prove that we are or are not optimal for black hole production. And if we are not, then his his multiverse idea is basically thrown out. It can't it can't be real. So people are actually thought about this and as far as I can tell I see some people think the uh the jury is still out. I've seen at least one prominent astronomer who argued that oh we definitely aren't optimal and argues that we aren't. So I think in typical science style everybody's just arguing about it. I don't know <laughs> I don't know that we'll ever actually converge. So I don't know that, you know it may be this whole falsifiability is sort of a yeah, in principle, but uh I don't know that we'll actually ever decide. But it's okay. sort of an interesting idea. Yeah, indeed. It's very interesting. Um, in your book, Visions of the Multiverse, uh, Steve, you write a little about, about the law of attraction and and how it relates to multiverses. Can you talk about that for a couple of minutes, please? Sure. Um, yeah, it was sort of funny. As I was settling down to thinking about writing this book, I, 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 I was on the phone with a friend of mine, and, and she says, Oh, I'm reading a new book, and I said, "Oh, yeah, what, what book is that?" And she goes, "And it and it's all about quantum physics." Well, and you don't know this woman, but she would definitely not be reading a book about quantum physics. And and I said, so I, I was very curious at this point. You know, well, what are you reading? And she said, "I'm reading The Secret." Well, I had heard about this book. It's by Rhonda Burns, and it's a you know massive bestseller. And uh, but it wasn't one I'd ever picked up. So, of course, when I talked to her, I had to go pick it up. And basically, this book claims that uh, quantum physics tells us that if you believe in something enough, uh, that that basically uh, the universe will deliver it to you. So it, it, it goes beyond the power of positive thinking, which I think most people agree is, is an important thing. Um, it, it actually claims that 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 somehow your belief and attitude will actually cause the universe to deliver this reality to you. And so I pondered this for a while because because of the claim it was coming out of quantum physics, I, I had a feeling that it had something to do with the idea of the multiverse in quantum physics. And and as near as I can tell, and, and the reason it's as near as I can tell, because if you go and you read The Secret or you watch the movie What the Bleep Do We Know, they basically talk about 
how every physicist out there will claim that this is true. They say it's shown in quantum physics that if you believe that 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 reality as you observe it comes from your mind, and that uh, it, uh, you can uh, the law of attraction is supported by quantum physics. Well. None of that is any quantum physics I ever learned, and anybody that I know ever learned. So, mm-hmm. so it made me very curious. And, and as near as I can figure, the story that they use it sort of mixes up two different ideas in quantum mechanics. One of them is the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is sort of weird because whenever you have a process that can happen and it has maybe multiple outcomes. All quantum mechanics can tell you is is the probability of the outcomes that you could see, but it can't tell you specifically which outcome you'll see. And so the mathematics of quantum mechanics has to preserve all of these possibilities until the very moment that something happens. And then the probability distribution collapses. So let me give you an example. I mean, suppose you walked in a hall and there are seven doors that you can go in. And, you know, there's a random chance that you'll go into any of the seven. So quantum mechanics could only tell you that there's an even probability of going in each of the seven, but it couldn't tell you which one that you'll actually choose. But once you choose one, that probability distribution collapses from flat in terms of uh, each door having a one-seventh probability into the fact that you actually chose one. So all of a sudden, the probability of going through that one is one. And so the mathematics has to shift at the very instant that you go through that one door. And that shift is instantaneous. And and in the lingo, we call it collapsing the wave function. And so the Copenhagen uh, interpretation of quantum physics says that, um, that, yeah, this wave function collapses instantaneously, but you shouldn't worry about it because you can't actually see the wave function. All you can see is that somebody went through the door. But physicists don't like this kind of instantaneous collapse. So there's a there's another because things have to move faster than the speed of light and stuff for that to happen. What physicists uh, there's there's an idea that came out in 1957 by a fellow named Hugh Everett called the Many Worlds Theory of Quantum Mechanics, and what he says is that in fact you go through all seven doors. Okay. It's just we only live in a thread where we can see one of the doors open. In other words, there's a wave function in the great universe which encompasses all the possibilities, and everything just continues to evolve within that great wave function. So in one universe, you went through one door, and in another universe, you went through a different door as a way to think about it. So at every quantum process, the universe basically... You, you get different threads in the in the great wave function in the universe that continue to to go. So this is an example of another way in which all the things that are possible are there. It's just these threads now are separated in a different way. Instead of being separated by you know some massive distance in the universe, here we're separated in dimensions of so-called Hilbert space, which is basically the complex mathematical space in which these calculations are done. So it's a little bit not so satisfying to think about it, but but my understanding is that in, in, in these calculations, you can basically share the same space-time, um, but you are separated within the theory and by other, other dimensions that are part of the calculation. So, But all possibilities happen. So as far as I can tell, these people who are doing the law of attraction idea are basically mixing up these two completely uh, conflicting views of quantum mechanics. And they're basically claiming that your mind somehow uh, causes the collapse of the wave function along threads of the many worlds that are what you want them to be. So that says a whole lot, and I think that uh, they're they're – People have thought about whether your brain is causing reality. Uh, basically, if you if you believe that consciousness or your brain is a product of the electrochemical processes that we understand inside the brain, then I think there's little doubt that that we can't be consciously causing things in the reality around us because the time scales are just wrong. We we have an idea of what the chemical time scales are in our brain. We know we know how long it takes for for things to move around and and it happens 
much too slowly for the kinds of quantum processes that are constantly happening in the world around us. So, But I do hear people who say, well, maybe we're not so tied to the electrochemical processes. But the minute you say that, you're in a world that I don't know anything about because that's not science anymore. Yeah. You know, yeah. it maybe we don't know everything about consciousness, and, it, and you know, maybe in the end that turns out to be the case. But I think that violates basic scientific methodology as I know it. You're you're using principles and phenomena that I don't know what to call. I don't know how it works. So all of a sudden, you know, once you're in that kind of realm, anything's possible. At any rate, so my friend was reading this and thought it was quantum physics, and and since I saw it had a connection with multiverses, and part of my mission is to is to educate with the book, I thought it would be fun to include that as one of my multiverse categories. And, and of course, I, I do have a few unconventional multiverse categories, some that are non-scientific. For example, if you, if you go back to how we defined the universe, well, planes of existence like heaven or hell or things like that actually fit my definition of a multiverse. So I created a category of multiverse for them which I call faith-based multiverses. So we don't have scientific evidence of these things existing, but people believe in them, and they do sort of fit my my definition of a, of a multiverse. So that was one of the strange things I ran across as I settled on how I wanted to categorize and classify these things. Well, Steve, that was the that was one of the final questions I was going to ask you about was uh, the afterlife. And I know you'd wrote about it in your book, so you beat, you beat me to the punch there. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let me uh, let me ask you then this final question: Would it ever be possible one day to visit these other universes? Well, I don't. I don't know. I mean, in the sense that you, the way that you ask it, would it be possible one day? What I can tell you is, as I've defined it, I don't see how we could because you would have to be causally connected to it in order to uh-huh. visit it. And once you say you're causally connected to it, it actually becomes part of our universe, not part of the great multiverse. So mm-hmm. another way to maybe ask it is, is it conceivable that what we think of now as our universe will be expanded as we learn about other things and learn how to detect them? And I guess that's possible. As as a conventional physicist who grew up in the 1900s and and uh and, uh, and the early 20th 21st century I'm pretty big believer in relativity and its limitations you know the speed of light and things like that so so I can't sit here and tell you that I think we can ever get there I don't know of ways around those things on the other hand as a physicist I, many of the great advances that we have made have 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 gone against what was the expectation at the time. And we have many, many examples of that. So I like to think that we don't know everything yet, and so hopefully people will learn uh, about things. I mean, there, there, there is an interesting observation which goes by the name of dark flow. Uh, people have actually noticed that all of the galactic clusters, that uh, or many of the galactic clusters in our universe, actually seem to be moving towards sort of one point in the sky. <laughs> and one interpretation of that is that there is something outside of our observable universe that's actually causing that attraction. So there's an example of a puzzle that had, was only discovered in, I think, about 2008. Uh, the jury is still out. People are aware of it. Legitimate scientists know about it, and they're continuing to study it. And it has one interpretation, which which basically involves the reality outside of our universe. So hopefully we'll have all sorts of interesting things like that through the years. And um, so it'd be fun to think that maybe we could. Indeed. We have been discussing the new book, Visions of the Multiverse, with Dr. Stephen Manley. Um, Steve, thank you very much for coming on to the show and talking about your book and talking about the wonderful world of physics and other things. My pleasure, Sandy. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Best of luck with your book. Bye-bye. Bye. That was Dr. Stephen Manley, author of The Provisions of the Multiverse. A link to the Amazon page is on the 
Universal Learning Series website and also a link to Dr. Stephen Manley's website, author of the book, Visions of the Multiverse. Thanks for listening to the Universal Learning Series radio show where we discover the spiritual and scientific universe. Have a great day.